Pyrokinase deficiency by itself does have a lot of complications, whether it's, it's treated and transfused or whether it's not treated with transfusions. There is chronic hemolysis and chronic anemia. We have all the complications of chronic anemia to begin with. That includes things like fatigue, exercise intolerance, you know, choosing a more sedentary lifestyle than a more active lifestyle, and impact on psychological as well as physical quality of life. All of those things are really important and that, that comes into play for, for all of the patients because of the severe anemia. Because it's a hemolytic process, you also have the, the propensity to develop gallstones and you have the propensity to have splenomegaly. Your spleen gets enlarged because it's constantly hemolyzing and constantly turning over as well as there is some component maybe of extra medullary hematopoiesis where the spleen is also trying to function as a hematopoietic organ and make new red blood cells. The gallstones, the splenomegaly, those are sort of more abdominal complaints. These individuals are chronically jaundiced. And so they, they, you know, there's the cosmetic aspect of that, which does play into the psychosocial and psychological quality of life types of, of issues as well. Then, you know, they, they could develop iron overload. And again, depending on how ineffective your erythropoiesis is, you have more or less chances of developing iron overload. That's something to monitor and then to proactively treat because otherwise you would run into all of the complications of the iron overload itself, including liver disease, cardiac disease, and endocrinopathies as well. Thinking broadly about non-immune hemolytic disorders that are long-standing raises several other approaches that need to be considered. These things would include cholelithiasis or gallstones, which are composed of bilirubin and are very common in people with long-standing hemolytic disorders. That needs to be considered in, in many situations. One example of this would be patients that have nonspecific GI distress, gastrointestinal distress, such as bloating or nausea after eating. If the patient has gallstones and an underlying hemolytic disorder, I often consider the diagnosis of biliary colic and at times cholecystectomy or removal of the gallbladder is very helpful. So that's one example of things to consider. A second example for patients with long-standing non-immune hemolytic anemias like PK deficiency is iron overload. Normally the iron balance is exquisitely taken care of within the body. Much of the iron that's utilized is recycled. A significant amount is absorbed in the intestinal tract. In PK deficiency and other similar diseases, the amount of iron that is absorbed is increased. Over time, this increase in iron can lead to a clinically significant iron overload. And it's certainly easier to prevent clinical iron overload than to treat it after there is any organ damage. Evaluation for iron overload with markers like ferritin and sometimes an MRI of the liver are often important markers for this complication of PK deficiency. Other complications may only happen much later in life, and I think leg ulcers are kind of a random complication. We don't know which patients will get that kind of complication. The osteopenia that can develop into osteoporosis is earlier than you would think for people without pyruvate kinase deficiency. It increases the chances of fractures, so it can be that a patient with pyruvate kinase deficiency has a fracture that wasn't expected for the degree of trauma. Other complications that we also see in hemolytic anemias such as pyruvate kinase deficiency include pulmonary hypertension and thrombotic events. We know that pyruvate kinase, kinase deficiency will increase the chances of getting blood clots, so it's not unusual for patients to develop uh, deep venous thrombosis or pulmonary embolisms. You have to appreciate that patients with pyruvate kinase deficiency have a chronic illness and therefore are often tethered to the medical system from childhood through their 
adolescence and adult life, which is different than somebody living 70 or 75 years and then getting sick when they're older and having to acutely manage a medical problem. This is a chronic medical problem that does take some skill in managing to be able to have the patient do their daily living, going to school, going to college, getting a job, and being successful in society. Number two is to manage the transition from pediatrics to adulthood. That's a particular problem in a variety of diseases and has even led to a subset of medicine that you might call transition medicine. The ability to be able to transition a patient from pediatric program, pediatric providers to their adult counterparts. I believe this is an underappreciated part of medicine. It's particularly common in hematologic diseases that are common, like sickle cell disease, for example. But it's also important in rarer diseases where you may only transition one patient every year or even less than that.